Hello, I'm Michael Pittman from Columbia University Medical Center. Um, I'd like to thank the NSDA for inviting me to speak today on some of our research that we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, this is about the treatment of laryngeal dystonia with an electrical neuromodulating implant. And this is an update on some research that we've been doing and um, what we're doing now. So I do have disclosures that some of this research was supported by grants from Medell and also from the Cure Dystonia Now Foundation and the NSDA itself. And I also have some patents related to some of what we'll be speaking about. So as you all know, uh, there are significant problems with the gold standard treatment of spasmodic dysphonia, which is botulinum toxin. It hurts, there's a mental dependency on it. You have to travel far, you have to coordinate your life schedules around the injections. And this is a lifelong treatment. Dr. Paniello had an excellent study in 2008 that really showed that even though this is the gold standard, it doesn't really do very well. Um, you have the on period uh, just after your injection where your voice is not optimal, then your voice is optimal. And then you have as your voice is coming off of the Botox and really over these every single cycle uh, between injections, your injections are given uh, here, uh, you have a decrease in your voice. And so your voice is really only optimal for about 30% of that cycle for your injection. So the thought was, this isn't great, so how can we do better? And a lot of that has to do with understanding the pathophysiology of the disease. Um, and that has really changed over the last 10 years. We understand much more of what's going on than we used to. And Part of what I found interesting is that is this is actually a somatosensory disorder, a disorder of proprioception, and that was something that I thought I could target. Um, and uh, in addition, we now know that this is really a large-scale functional and structural network neurologic disorder, and this is a schematic uh, by Dr. Simone of a 3D image of the brain and all the different connections that are uh, going on um, and how they're abnormal in patients with laryngeal dystonia. And so it's not just uh, the what's happening in the brain, but it's the whole circuit and how the brain talks to the periphery. And to understand the proprioception uh, and how proprioception is involved in laryngeal dystonia, you need to really understand what the gamma loop is. Essentially, uh, you have uh, a axons coming out of the brain that are telling your muscle what to do. And then you have little organs inside the muscle called muscle spindles that are proprioceptive organs. So it tells your brain where in space your muscles are and how fast they're moving. So essentially it controls the function of and position of the vocal folds. And that organ then sends back a sensory signal up to the brain. And so the brain understands, uh, reads that signal and then translates it. And then again, sends the motor signals back down to the muscle. And so somewhere in this circuit, uh, if you can break that or manipulate that, maybe you can decrease the hyperexcitability uh, of the central nervous system, which is the really of the cortex, of the central nervous of the central nervous system, which is the real issue in patients with laryngeal dystonia. So, in terms of muscle spindle fun um, being an important function of proprioception, uh, this has been shown back as early as 1995 that in focal dystonia, uh, actually proprioception is a significant issue. And even if you have laryngeal dystonia, we know that your arm proprioception will be abnormal. So it's a global proprioceptive dysfunction. And again, the muscle spindle is one of the major proprioceptive organs throughout the body. So how does Botox work? We used to think it worked by weakening the muscles in the larynx, but that's not really accurate. It probably works uh, by inhibiting the axon that sets the gain of the muscle spindle. And that in turn decreases the um, excitability uh, transferred up through the sensory axon to the brain and probably results in some sort of uh, decreased um, excitability uh, in the cortex. And so essentially by manipulating the uh, messages coming from the periphery, you can manipulate what's happening in the central nervous system. And so I thought, you know, if this is really what's happening, maybe we could better treat patients if we just directly targeted this gamma loop and directly targeted a manipulation of the 1AA pharynx neuron um, 
using something different than botulinum toxin. And I was working in nerve regeneration at that point, and I had met uh, some of the scientists from Medell, and they were using, we were, we were discussing using electrical stimulation to manipulate uh, nerve regrowth. Um, but ultimately, I thought of this idea and we decided to work on it together to use nerve stimulation to uh, decrease or inhibit uh, the excitability of the 1A afferent neuron. Uh, the hypothesis was that electrical stimulation of the thyroid muscle at levels below alpha motor neuron activation, so essentially targeting that 1A afferent neuron, will result in improved symptoms of spasmodic dysphonia. And the main study we did so far was a, a study just a proof of concept. Um, we had five patients who are at least three months from their last botulinum toxin injection. We put uh, a hook wire electrode into the left thyroid muscle and stimulated them one hour a day for five days in a row. And this is relatively crude stimulation. Um, and uh, we looked at, you know, does this crude stimulation work at all in, in terms of proving, improving patient's voice? And we looked at some of the outcome measures we have, the voice handicap index, counting spasms, uh, asking the patients to rate their voice and also blinding some um, speech language pathologists and asking them to rate the voice as well. As we know, there aren't great outcome measures for spasmodic dysphonia. And the results showed that across the board, patients all did better uh, in their voice handicap index, their voices had decreased spasms, uh, they felt that their voice improved over the five days of stimulation. And most importantly, they also had carryover between they had improvement of their voice, not just during the stimulation time, but for three to 12 days after the stimulation um, was terminated. Uh, so essentially you can treat someone and that treatment will last. Uh, and the blinded speech language pathologist also found that these patients' voice, voices improved significantly. Now, again, we don't have great outcome measures to really capture that. So I'm just gonna let you listen to some of the voices here. This is before stimulation. And eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. I eat apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. And here's her voice afterwards. I ate apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. I ate apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. So clearly she's better, not perfect, but better. Here's another sample. I eat apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. I eat apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. And here she is afterwards. I eat apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. I eat apples and eggs. Did he go to the right or to the left? Early one morning, a man and a woman were ambling along a one mile lane running near Rainy Island Avenue. So clearly, clearly these voices aren't perfect, but they're better. And so it, we proved that the stimulation does work in patients. So what were the next steps uh, after that? So uh, essentially we needed better outcome measures. It's really important to be able to objectively show that patients have significantly improved. Um, and to go forward with the research uh, and the time and effort and finance that takes uh, would be very important to be able to have the measures to prove that uh, your intervention is actually helping. You can't just say, hey, listen to these two voices. So, um, and what, what it does, if you have good objective outcome measures, it allows the implant to be accepted by the FDA, by the European Medicines Agency, and more importantly, over time to get insurances to pay for these implantations to be put in. And so uh, one of the things that 
I found, because I was looking for a patient reported outcome measure that was actually validated for spasmodic dysphonia, was the communicative participation item bank. Uh, this was created by uh, Carolyn Baylor, uh, University of Washington. And it's been validated in, in, in uh, head and neck cancer and patients with ALS or multi um, And so I felt, you know, if this is valid for those disorders, it should certainly be valid for a real communicative, a, a real disease that has a communication um, dysfunction that's central to the disorder. Uh, so um, I contacted her and we decided to move forward. And what this does is this communication participation item bank is it measures how a disorder impacts a person's communication participation. And what that is, is an individual's partition, par participation in and fulfillment of their life roles that involve communications where knowledge, information, ideas, or feelings are exchanged. And to me, that's just life. I mean, we do that all day long, uh, whether it's socially or in business. Um, this is how we interact with the world. And that's what this, is, this measures. And the best part about the CPIB is that it was created to the highest standards of the PROMISE program, which was an NIH program to develop new outcome measures uh, with the latest psychometric um, tools and, and mathematics, uh, which was a much higher standard than we had used previously when we were developing things like the uh, VHI. Um, and these are a sample of a short form of questions and uh, what it looks like. So does your condition interfere with talking with the people you know? And everything, everything begins with that. Does your condition interfere with communicating when you need to say something quickly? asking questions in a conversation, communicating in a small group of people, having a long conversation with someone, you know, about a book, a movie, or a sporting event. These are just um, very uh, pointed questions, but I think that everyone here can really relate to that. And essentially, the original uh, CPIB uh, was 46 questions. Um, and our goal for this study was two aims. The first was to validate that 46 item question uh, for SD. So is the CPIB valid for SD period? All right, so that was aim one and it took 200 patients to do that. We got about 170, which was more than enough in terms of the power. And then aim two was cutting that down to 15 questions uh, and uh, so that we could use it clinically and in research because 46 is, a, is, is too much. And also the 15 questions, if chosen correctly, will be just as valid as the 46. And then we gave these 15 questions six weeks after your Botox injection. And so essentially we we're using that to see if the, the short form could be valid as an outcome measure that could distinguish between pre and post treatment and quantify the amount of improvement, allowing us then to show improvement with an intervention. And what we concluded was that the CPIB does represent the next generation of patient reported outcome measures. It is valid as an outcome measure for laryngeal dystonia, and it is sensitive to changes pre and post intervention. So essentially we can start using, and we have and other uh, centers have already started using this as a valid measure for both clinical use and research use in laryngeal dystonia. Um, we can use it now to help target our botulinum toxin injections better. And also more importantly, we can use it to evaluate new therapies that are, that are coming uh, in the future. Um, and so not only was the CPIB something that we were incorporating into our research, but MedL uh, also got a, looked at a lot of acoustic measures and found that maximum phonation time is a good, more objective measure of change after uh, treatment in spasmodic dysphonia, and also a change in the fundamental frequency uh, on a spectrogram, which is really a uh, output of your evaluation, uh, evaluating your voice. And then also um, uh, Edie Hapner and Mike Johns uh, validated this strain scale here, the Omni strain scale for spasmodic dysphonia. And we are incorporating all of these into uh, our current research, okay? And that's going on uh, now in four centers in Europe, essentially. Uh, the trial that is underway now is evaluating stimulation of the in internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, uh, directly uh, targeting the 1A afferent neuron. Uh, and Dr. Schneider Stickler is running the group in Vienna 
Dr. Uh, Potashnik in Innsbruck, Dr. Nock in Berlin, and Dr. Volk uh, in Jena. The goal of this, again, is to target the superior laryngeal nerve, which is the sensory nerve to the larynx, uh, and to accumulate about 20 patients. We're halfway there. Uh, we had uh, some difficulties, as you can imagine, with COVID. And we're stimulating patients for 30 minutes a day for five days. And we're doing acoustic uh, evaluations uh, during that stimulation and an hour after the stimulation. And many of those other outcome measures that we talked about were actually starting at the beginning of the week and at the end, the end of the week to see if we have objective improvement uh, with stimulation. So in the future, we need to refine the stimulation. Um, there are multiple different parameters to the stimulation, you know, the, the, how much stimulation, how often the stimulation, how much on, how much off, things like that. And also uh, hopefully start moving towards implantation studies um, where we would use a modified uh, cochlear implant. This is one of the earlier designs that was used for uh, bilateral vocal fold pacing and has already been implanted in uh, nine patients. And of course, uh, the majority of this technology has been used for many years uh, for cochlear implants. So a lot of this has already been worked out and it'll be very easy for us to uh, modify that uh, when we ultimately figure out um, the appropriate uh, stimulation that would be needed to optimize outcomes for patients with laryngeal dystonia. So uh, that's where we are today. And again, uh, thank you for allowing me to update you on our research and I'm looking forward to any questions you may have.